We've seen you. We want the swinging blue jeans. Oh, I can imagine. And her daughter said, oh, mom, you did not yell that out. She's like, well, yeah, because uh, you guys were better. She said, we had more fun. The swinging blue jeans were, yeah, we danced more to swinging blue jeans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Take us back to those days. Oh, Tell yeah. me what the cavern was like. I need to sit down now. Um, <laughs> we had some the cavern well. club, no, it's fine. The cavern club was not, uh, people think that, uh, have this image of the cavern club, but actually it was a dirty, dingy little cellar in downtown Liverpool that was in the city part of it with like lots of warehouses and offices and stuff and, and this was right down, you had to go down some steps, two lots of steps and there's the scary part, there was no back entrance to that club so I mean as far as fire hazard was concerned it was a fire hazard and all the bands, I mean they used to have four bands a night and the bands would actually they'd have to come in the front door with all the gear, carry, no road managers in those days. So the bands carrying amps and carrying guitars, and it was very dingy. And as, as Jerry Marsden, my friend Jerry, he is a friend, he said, it always smelt of disinfectant. It smelt of disinfectant all the time. Well, I guess it could have smelled of worse things than disinfectant. <laughs> well, that's but right. Yes. I, when I've seen it, I thought the same thing, by the grace of God a fire or oh. something horrible didn't come out. And the thing that amazed me about the stage where all this music was born is that it, it appeared to me, you see the distance of us standing here? Mm -hmm. This was pretty much the stage. Is that fair to say? Yes, very much it so. It was tiny. Well, the, and there was just a little dressing room, like similar to that little setup there. And once you were in there, you stayed in there. So there'd be like three or four bands, which, or groups as we used to call them, which is, what, 12, 15 people, all stuffed in there. And then invariably, you've, you're doing a double that night. You know, you do the cavern and then you're off to some other place. So it's just permanently moving around. But my, the group, my first group was called the Escorts, and uh, I'm very excited because I, I'm going to be signing and stuff out in the foyer a bit later uh, after this particular thing, and uh, I've got CDs of the Escorts. I've finally got the rights, and uh, I'm going to be able to you know, sign them and sell them on whatever you do, you know? How old were you when you formed the Escorts? 15. I left school when I was 14. I wouldn't advise it to anybody these days, isn't it? It's what, not the best. What did your parents say about that? They didn't like it. <laughs> My dad, actually, I lived in a little, uh, what we call a two up, two down house, uh, just around the corner from Paul McCartney's house in Fortland Road. And I was in Hayden Road. And uh, in fact, they turned his house into a museum. Right. And they, they scoured all over the country to find furniture that matched that 50s and 60s era. All they had to do was go to my mum and dad's house. <laughs> it's still there. My dad's not a great, uh, he doesn't know what Home Depot is, you know. <laughs> but no, it was great days and uh, what did you ask? What was the question? I've forgotten. <laughs> no, so, so you were 15, how did your parents feel about leaving school? Uh, I lived in a little two up, two a down house. The memory goes a bit. You know what? We started off in the 60s. Now we're in our 60s. How about that? We did it. How many years were the escorts together? What was your first question? <laughs> my dad. Okay, I'll tell you about yeah. my dad. I worked in a garage. I left school at 14, uh, nearly, just about to be 15, and uh, went to work in a garage. Uh, and my boss was a guy called Peter Harrison, who just happened to be the older brother of George Harrison. And the first day I started, he said, uh, he, well, you know, what are you interested in? I said, oh, I like football and I like music. He says, oh, oh, my brother's in Germany right now playing at the Star Club. George Harrison. So George used to bring his uh, car in to get serviced and stuff when he was in Liverpool. And he used to give me old strings and old picks. And they are on eBay as we speak, you know, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad, no, my dad wasn't happy about me leaving school at 14. And in fact, as I said, a two up, two down house, which means two rooms up, two down. Six months, he never said a word to me. Really? Mm-hmm. It's pretty tough. But he was right. He, yeah. In, in, in you know, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, I, uh, you should not leave school when you're 14. But it worked for me. It worked for me. You know, just quick story, side story, because I just heard it this past weekend, a friend who was a musician playing in Greenwich Village, and there was a kid from Long Island, Randy Wolf, who later became Randy California and the band Spirit. He's 16 years old, and there's this black kid playing blues there called Jimmy James. And Jimmy says to him, hey, I, this guy from the Animals wants to fly me over to London, and we're going to be a band, and I need a rhythm guitarist. Do you want to go? He said, yeah, that would be fun. So he goes home and said, hey, Dad, so this kid I play with in the, in one of the, in the clubs, uh, he's going to London, and there's this guy from the band The Animals wants to manage him. Can I go? 
Not on your life. <laughs> who would tell a 16-year-old ever you can go to England with some guy who plays in the club? And that's how Randy California did not wind up in the Jimi Hendrix experience. Oh, yeah. Wow. But just as what, what Terry was saying, would you tell your 16-year-old it's okay to go? No, it was the absolute correct thing to do. Sometimes you do it and it works out, but... I think you've got to be driven. I mean, I was driven, to you had say to, the least. You knew you had to do it. It's, it's like I, I love my sport and I love watching American football and stuff. And I like watching documentaries on sports stars and music as well. But, you know, because I'm a musician, I tend to go for the other thing, you know? And I, and I love these when you, people like Wayne Gretzky and you see what they did to get where they did. And, and the sacrifices the parents made. My dad, my dad made no sacrifice, actually. But, you know, I'm sure he's proud of me in a, in a kind of nice way. But, I think but you is. did. I mean, the one theme, whether it's Wayne Gretzky or, you know, whether it's Terry Sylvester or Paul McCartney, the amount of hours, the effort, that goes into making a successful career as a performer, whether it's on the field or in front of a microphone. How hard did you guys work in those days to try to put together a band to make? A lot harder than I do now, I promise you. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you used to practice. I mean, in the, we didn't have basements in England. Uh, there was no such thing, so all this, and we didn't have a garage, so forget the garage band thing. Right. Forget the going down in the basement. We, we used to have to go to the church hall and practice. And in fact, the Beatles used to do that. They used to practice. Uh, there was a synagogue just around the corner. I lived in Allerton, which was uh, you know, a, a Jewish area, and Paul McCartney lived in Allerton. And there was a synagogue there. And uh, we used to go and practice in the synagogue. We used to you know, ask the rabbi, who was OK, <laughs> to go practice. And, he, and he, basically, what we do, we practice. And of course, being clever, he would say, we want you to do a show, of course, at the end of the month, which the Beatles used to play at the synagogue. Did they really? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Love it. Playing yes, the Milman Bar Mitzvah. Here well, bar Mitzvah, that's what John Lennon Beatles. used to say. He used to say that. <laughs> well, you know, in going to Liverpool, I remember going to the Aintree Institute. A the Aintree, Aintree, yes. Aintree Institute. That's right. And, you know, just looking at this nothing kind of reception hall, you know, just a generic neighborhood wedding kind of hall, and the signs all up all over of all these people who played there, and you That's think, right. wow, like, but where, yeah, where else would you play? We used to play in uh, what they called working men's clubs uh, and, and British legions and things like that. Shot uh, in the beer kind of place oh, for... Yes, and uh, the, well, the, when I was with the Swinging Blue Jeans, uh, we did a show in Yorkshire once, and Yorkshire is not far Far from you know Liverpool. It's very you know the funny thing is when you're in the UK, you're never more than 60 miles away from water. You know such a small place. Right. So we were in uh, the middle of uh, Yorkshire, some Rawton Stall, Yorkshire, or something like that. And they're waiting to go on. They used to have the curtains, and it was like a you know a, a half this size. And there's people sitting there drinking beer, and the MC comes on, and he's got a flat cap on. <laughs> and, he goes, and he's supposed to introduce us, and we're all behind the curtain. And he goes, "This is his introduction." He, first of all, he goes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the hot pies will be ready in 15 minutes, and here they are, the swinging blue jeans. <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> That's a great intro. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, goodness <laughs> sake, you know I mean, please. The hot pies were great because we had some later. <laughs> See, now that is true working class rock and roll. I'm a working That's... class lad, don't you worry about it. <laughs> That's I'm a right. posh. That's right, lad. How, how many years were the Blue Jeans together? Well, I was in the Escorts uh, and, and until 66, and then I joined the Blue Jeans because we had the same manager and the guitarist left, so I joined. Uh, but in, in general, I think well, the Blue Jeans are still going. I mean, Ray right. Ennis, he, he taught me a lot. He taught me how to drink, actually. Ray really? Ennis. Yeah. By the way, this water here tastes like gin and tonic. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it works. It's amazing. <laughs> How old were you when he taught you the... Uh... I don't think I had my first drink till I was 18, which is not bad, you know. Especially in Liverpool, right? Right. I never, I never went with my first girlfriend until I was 18, so I was pretty... I should have stayed at school, shouldn't I? I would have learned a lot more. <laughs> Poor boy who was swept away into a life of sin, of rock and roll. That's right. He was on a good path there for a while, that boy. <laughs> And look what's happened to him now. Oh, God. Actually, my biggest break, I'm sure you're going to come to it, but I'll, I'll jump the gun, was Graham Nash, who I'm sure you all know, decided he wanted to be... Yep, yep, Graham. Good old Graham, great guy. He decided he wanted to, you know, move away from the Hollies and do something different, and he obviously, you know, met Stills and Crosby and then... Um, what's his name, the Canadian? Neil. Neil Young, that's it. Oh, Neil just Young. testing, just testing. Actually, I think he's the t most talented of the lot, Neil Young, to be honest with you. I think he's fantastic. 
But anyways, they're great guys. So uh, Graham decides to leave, and then uh, that was my big break. I, uh, I got, you know, the job of filling his boots, if you like. And in fact, the first, the first TV show I did, they didn't have time to get me a suit, so I actually wore Graham's suit. But I was a bit taller than him, so I had a gap of about that down by my feet. <laughs> so the cameraman was told, don't go anywhere near his feet. Yeah, like, the oh, socks sticking up. It was terrible, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Very nice. And what's, when, what year do you get to that the That was six, 1968, December 68. Uh, I'll never forget it. It was the most fantastic day of my life. Just marvelous, marvelous. And the hits that we know you from the Hollies on? Or? Well, the, the, the Hollies before I joined obviously had Bus Stop, Carry On, Stop, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And then when I joined, uh, my first song was uh, Sorry Suzanne, which was a minor hit in the States, but a big hit in England. Thank you, thank you. And then, of course, He and Heavy is my brother, which... Uh, was the best, that's my favorite. With Elton John playing the piano on here. Really? Heavy. Yes. Didn't Session, Reg Dwight he was called. Right? Wow. Reg Thank Dwight came in sure. and I think we paid him four pounds. <laughs> and I think he was glad of it. Because I spoke to him once about, you know, session work and stuff. And he basically says, I said, well, you know, what, what, did anyone ever offer you percentages of the records? And he said, oh, no, I'd rather have the cash there and then, because the chances are he'd do 10 sessions a day and not one of those records would even get released. So you're better off getting the money up front. He was right, yeah. He was right. Well, look, we set him on the road to where he is, isn't it? <laughs> is he married to a man? Yes. Oh, okay, that's yes. fine. So you're saying that would be your influence? He's married to a Canadian man, actually, and I live in Toronto. <laughs> He's living anywhere he wants to live. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia, doesn't he? Yes. Yes. Coming back here in a couple of weeks to play his 60th performance at Madison Square Garden on his 60th birthday. Wow. 60 shows at Madison Square Garden. I've, never, solo I've never even been there, never mind playing there. <laughs> I saw, I think I saw Muhammad Ali once do a boxing. Did they used to box at? Mo yes. Yeah, that was fabulous. Yeah. Cassius Clay, That's and the greatest. <laughs> what, which, which took England by storm. And mm. It's amazing when you think of the influence. We were just talking about this for a while. And by the way, I see some hands. We will do some. Uh, I'll run out and do Phil Donahue and. Uh, no questions about my sexuality, please. <laughs> which means, really, please ask him some questions <laughs> about it. It's. It's funny how, I, I actually, I had this conversation with uh, Stephen Van Zandt, actually, who's a huge fan of British Invasion, Little Stephen, The Sopranos, and Bruce Springsteen, how Bruce. it was this renaissance of time of writing, of singing, of performing, that Larry Kane was up before, and he was saying how this, the culture of celebrity now just seems like rubbish, that, you know, we follow these girls, and they don't sing anything interesting. They're not making any interesting music. They, they just, look all right, though. Yeah, but that's it. That's and about that's, it. That's it, that you should have to do more mm -hmm. in order to be a, a worship celebrity. Well, let me ask you a question. What has Paris Hilton ever done? Absolutely nothing. Apart from being an arsehole. That's it. <laughs> Did I swear? I'm sorry about that. It, you know, we always think that the, the people that we grew up with, the, the people who were our heroes who we listened to, like, you know, everyone thinks their generation was better than what the kids have today, as our parents thought of, you, you know, the big band singers and whatever. And not that I love that era of singing as well, but you guys were creating music. You guys, whether it was fashion or, or music or taste or style, the British Invasion wasn't just some songs. It was an energy that swept through this country. Well, we, the thing, the difference was, we were t I was talking about it last night. We had a little uh, get-together here. We were, we were writing playing and singing and also being funny and having fun whereas before it was a bit more serious before that you know and, and you'd have guys in locked in rooms in new york writing songs for pop stars well and then the pop star goes in and he's singing a song and he doesn't really he sings somebody else's words you know we sang our own words and now you mentioned bruce springsteen when i was in the hollies we we were the first group band to ever record a Bruce Springsteen song when we we did a, a version of Sandy the 4th of July Asbury I remember Park. that yes and we and we played at the bottom line in New York City fantastic we did two shows there and Bruce Springsteen lined up outside and paid with everybody else to watch us sing the song and he came backstage we, we didn't we just said you know Bruce the writer of because he hadn't made it properly you know right. And uh, he came in and got introduced, and we had some photographs taken. And I'm just waiting for Bruce to record one of my songs now. I'm just really looking forward to it. 
But you hit the nail on the head. You were writing your songs, and for better or worse, that changed the whole playing field with the Brill Building, where, and it, no effect, you know, Ellie Greenwich wrote great songs, and Carol King. Oh, I mean, yeah. Carol King was on my show a few months ago and said the same thing. Thanks to the Beatles and everybody else, that's what gave me and Neil Diamond and Simon and Garfunkel the chance to finally leave the room Correct. to say, okay, instead of just writing this and handing this to you, I'm going to write this and walk into a recording studio. Because, oh. you know, Tapestry was oh. such a, a mind-blowing album for what it did. But when would a girl who is just, you know, a Jewish girl from Brooklyn who write, knocks out hit songs and great songs like Up on the Roof and, you know, a, a Locomotion. But uh, if it wasn't for you guys doing that, nobody would have ever said, well, have a go at it. You would just hand it to Dusty Springfield. You would hand it to, you would hand it to somebody. Mm -hmm. And... For better or worse, the other people, the, the Fabians of the world, got pushed to the side of the road. Like mm -hmm. I said, whether it's good or bad, if you couldn't bring a song, then, well, who's writing it for you? I actually went to see, went to see I live in Toronto these days, which is a great city, and uh, from where I live, I can actually see uh, Rochester in the United States, and it excites me. From where I'm on the, like, the eighth floor, and I look out the, my, my little office thing that I've got, and I see the States, and it really excites me, because I love them, I love the USA, I always loved I never forget when I joined the Hollies. Thank you. Uh, no, it's true. When I first joined the Hollies, and I'd never been to the United States, and all my friends, like Billy J. Kramer, who I believe is in the building. Yes, Billy J. Kramer's here. in the building. He is in the building. Um, you know, people like that, they were going to the States and doing tours, and then coming back and saying, oh, man, you've no idea what it's like. It's great New York City. And, of course, I, I was... I hadn't made it. I hadn't had a hit record. And only when I joined the Hollies did I get that jump up to travel internationally over to the, you know, the US and Canada. And I'll never forget flying into JFK and just looking out the window and seeing what I can, funnily enough, see from this, my hotel room here, just seeing the skyline of Manhattan. It was just mind-blowing. And then getting off the plane and seeing these big wide cars and, and then I saw McDonald's. <laughs> and I'd never seen a McDonald's. No, it was just 1971. You know, you've got to think, you know, what, like 22, 23 or something? It's just fantastic. And I've been coming back on a regular basis ever since, and uh, I love it. I just love the place. It's, you were always received warmly here, weren't you? You, was always, you felt like you were home. That well, the, some of the always... husbands weren't too happy, but <laughs> it, it, normally it was okay, yeah. But it's funny, it, it's a very universal story. And again, I'm not saying this to name drop, I'm using this as a, as a point of reference. I, I talked with Pete Townsend on Monday, he was in, with the, they were performing. You name dropper. But it was the same thing. He was like, w you know, what's going to be? What's going to be? And he said, New York always embraced British artists with open arms. If you had a song, if you look, if you stunk, you were throw you left with your tail between your legs. But if you had a song and you had a band, it says, nobody welcomed us like New York City. I knew I could easily live here. I felt like, wow, I, my home is there, my family's here, but I could live here if I wanted to. I think the day you don't get excited about seeing the skyline, you might as well forget it. It's just, it just doesn't matter how many times you see that. It just thrills you. And even if I worked there every day at Wall Street, I think I'd get the thrill, you know? I yeah. just love it. So, hey, Terry, what, can I do some questions from the audience? No want, problem at all. Here, take a seat. We're going to... We'll, Thank you. We'll Where do you want to take it? Uh, <laughs> you English folks. With you. Is this on? Do we have this, uh, this mic hot? <laughs> Check. <Ooh. laughs> it's on. But I lost my spotlight. Oh. Well, I, I lost my spotlight. Oh, I've got, got a spotlight. Go we'll I've find. got to have a spotlight. I I'm an artist. This gentleman has his, his hand up. For a while. First of all, oh, Mr. Sylvester owe you money before I... No, okay, good. What's your name? John. Hi, John. Uh, I was fortunate enough, I was in the military at the time, but I got a chance to see uh, a show, Top of the Pops. Oh, yeah. And it was 1969, I'm pretty mm. sure. I would have been on that you one. You guys were uh, doing... He Ain't Heavy, He's My yes, Brother. Yes, that was 1969. Now, you were taping for the following week. Ah, were you so actually I, in the building? So I, I was in the building. I was and in there. And that's right. They after the show, a grand ap occasion to come. After the show, they used to do some taping because exactly. they'd say, "What are you doing next week?" We were on so tour. I saw you back. So we do an as extra a one. Man, as I was a younger man. But the point I have to ask you something: there was an older gentleman that was there with you guys, and I, I think they, you guys, called him Pops or something, and and you kept doing that. the song. You guys did that song until you got it perfect. 
You did maybe three takes of He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother in order to get it right. But there was an older gentleman that they kept, you guys kept asking, how did it sound? Do you recall who that was? I was just curious. Would he be working for us, you mean? Yes. Well, we had, uh, we had a manager called Rob, Robin Britton. Maybe And so. he used to rob Britain, believe me, Robin Britton. <laughs> That's a different story. 83% tax in the 60s for, the, for people like us. Um, that's, that's why Tom Jones left. Uh, there was a guy called Rod, Rod Shields, huh. and there was a guy called Derek Wyman. They were our road people, but I, I, don't, I don't particularly recall that. What were we calling him, Pops? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. He was an older gentleman, and he must have had that ear, you know? Wow. And, and he kind of basically said, you got the take. I was probably too busy looking at the women in the audience to no, know. No, no, no. I don't think it, you know, it was like after the show, after the show we there used really to, wasn't much of an audience. There might have been some people there, but you guys were perfection. Oh, well, that, yeah, you picked a good song. You uh -huh. picked a good time to go. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Tony, in 1958, there was a movie called Violent Playground. It was about a group of Liverpool teenagers with a leader named John. I was wondering if you remember that film. Violent Playground. Uh, that, I, remember the, I remember the film, the movie. We, we call them films in England. Or we go into the pictures. We go into the flicks. Because they just go... The flicks. The movies. I, I remember Violent Playground. Uh, I don't, was there songs from it? Was it like a musical or just a... Uh, no, it was a, a drama about... A, a crime of, thing. Yeah. It's probably written baseball. about me. <laughs> I was 11 then in Liverpool. Ooh, bad place. Was it pop, a popular film with the Liverpool kids? It could have been about Liverpool, Violent Playground. It would have probably been. But uh, yeah, I mean, the 50s in Liverpool, you had to be tough. You had to be tough in Liverpool, believe me. And I wasn't. I was a good runner. I could run very quick. You know, the, the funny thing is, Terry, that I found that it really wasn't until, what, maybe 10 years ago or so that Liverpool has become this center of art and commerce and they fixed up Matthew Street and it's beautiful. I've, I've seen pictures of it from 15, Lovely. 20 years ago and it looks as rough and tumble as it did 40 years ago. What they've done, like they've done a lot of places around the world, they, they, the, bat, the worst area was right by the water with all the old warehouses and, and you know, there was rats all over the place. What they did, they just developed, got the developers in, like they did in London at Canary Wharf. Or, is it Canary or Canary? I can't remember, Canary Wharf. And, and they've used, because who doesn't want to live on the water, you know? Right. So, and they've cleaned it up, so that actually the, the safest place now in Liverpool is downtown, whereas years ago that was not the safest place. And look, the same thing has happened here in New York oh, City. Oh, fabulous, yeah. You know, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, I, we, you know, as I was a kid, we wouldn't go there forever. Now I can't afford to live there. <laughs> a cop on every corner. <laughs> Where's, uh, I saw some hands over here. Where's he going? Yes, sir. Has he left me? Yeah, hi. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what the rest of the band is doing now. Uh, yeah, uh, Tony Hicks, uh, the guitar player, and Bobby Elliott, the drummer. They're still going around calling themselves the Hollies, uh, with about f three or four other people with them who, who are about half their age, but that's okay, it, it doesn't bother me. <clears throat> uh, but no, that's there, so there we go. Alan Clark retired. Uh, actually, you know what? We're all still alive. And that's, that's good. F five or six, Graham Nash, you know what he's doing. Uh, I'm sitting here with you guys. And I'll be outside uh, signing some autographs and doing stuff after this, so you want to come up and say hi, you're welcome. Was there ever a thought, Terry, of trying to put together the original lineup again and doing another thing? Remember the Eagles? Hell freezes over? Yeah. Something like that. Got it. And let's not forget that they've made a fortune. Well, that's the point, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, I've been to Liverpool and been to this thing called the Mersey Cats, which is all the guys that used to play at the Cavern who get together on a Thursday. Um, my favorite band is the Undertakers. I was wondering if you know those guys, Jeff, Jeff Nugent and a few of the others, Ferens, Flamingos, etc. I remember J Jeff, a sax player? No, was Jeff he played sax? Three, three finger guitar player. Oh. He's amazing. <laughs> oh dear. I know the name, yeah. I mean, actually, The Undertakers were. Um, they were unlucky. They didn't get any hit records, a bit like the Escorts. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of groups. There was hundreds and hundreds of groups. And believe me, uh, I was very pleased for everybody that got hits, but not. It, what, they weren't all the, always the most talented people, and the Undertakers in particular were. On, they were like a, a bit of a soul uh, band, you know. And uh, they had a sax player. That's why I thought he was the sax guy. But uh, the Mersey Cats, I've heard of them. I think they do do the, do, the, do lots of benefits for musicians who are in trouble and stuff in, in Liverpool. Yeah, good people. 
Sir, you have a question. Yeah, how did the, the Hollies find uh, the Bruce Springsteen song? Did you, because you were on the same record company, or, or how did you discover uh, Fourth of July? That's a good question. Uh, we, we used to, if we, if we had a recording session to do, you know, it was, we used to record at Abbey Road, which was um, <clears throat> the most wonderful experience. And I'll, I'll answer that question uh, in a sec. What I'm going to do, tell you a story about Abbey Road. When I was in the Swinging Blue Jeans, we were recording some stuff there, and the Beatles were in uh, Studio 2, we were in Studio 3. And they were recording, and it was kind of all secret what they were doing. This is around 1967, this. Anyway, uh, Paul McCartney popped in our studio and said, come, come in if you like, guys, after, after you've finished, and listen to what we're doing. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we kind of trooped in there, and uh, they were passing stuff around, but uh, I don't smoke, so uh, it didn't bother. I just had a drink or something. Anyways, we were sitting there listening, and... He said, this is what we're working on right now. We heard, and we were looking at, we were looking at each other going, it sounds like Glenn Miller, what's going on? <laughs> it was, and Paul McCartney was down in the studio doing the vocal for When I'm 64. So I actually witnessed that, and I, I'm so proud of that. I, I can't believe I was there. And, uh, but it was, it was strange to, to, the, you know, to the naked ear, as they say. It was like, what are they doing? But they knew what they were doing, obviously. And he's 64 right now. She said, and he's 64 And right he is now. 64, yeah, and I will be in 20 years. I'll look forward to it. <laughs> hey, Terry, did they well, play What was the question anything? about? What was that about? Did, did they play you Oh, Bruce Springsteen, else? sorry? Yes. Yeah, about how you found the Bruce song. Okay, I'll tell you. Bef that's why I mentioned Abbey Road. We, we, we used to not have, you know, three or four months every year, we'd put aside to go in the studio. So you had to have some material. So we used to write stuff ourselves, obviously. But we used to kind of put a little bit of pressure on ourselves as well by going around to the music publishers and saying, what have you got that's, you know, like for us? And most of the time, they'd be things like, sorry, Suzanne, Carrie, you know, in other words, girls' names. Oh, there's a song about Julianne, Hollies. You know, it was that type of thing. But what happened was a, a guy called Adrian Rudge was at Chapel, uh, Warner Chapel now. It used to be called Intersong. And he said, there's this guy in the States, he's a songwriter, and apparently he sleeps with the radio on every night, and he wakes up in the morning, he starts writing these songs, a guy called Bruce Springsteen, he said, and here's one of the songs he wrote, Sandy, the fireworks are hailing over little Eden tonight, forcing the light, it was Sandy, the, you know, 4th of July, Asbury Park, so we loved it, and we went in the studio, did it, got an orchestra, and it went on an album called Another Night, in, I think, 1976, and Epic Records here was so, they really thought we'd, you know, remade it, if you like, because we hadn't had a hit since The Air That I Breathe, which was 71. Two years is a long time in the music industry not to have a hit, you know. Anyway, we, 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 the album was great, but, it, it, you know, we were kind of from the 60s, and they, they were playing different stuff, and it just never made it. But, you know, I include it in my act when I go around doing my uh, stage act, and everyone loves it, and everybody knows it. So uh, I, I love it, you know. Thank you. So that's how we found it. Yes, sir. Welcome, Terry. I have two Hi. questions for you. Uh, are the Hollies in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? No. They should be. Thank you. Second we are working on it. Good. Second question is, long, cool woman in a black dress. Was there an original inspiration, a woman, for that song? <laughs> I can't discuss that on this stage. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever working for the FBI? That's no, what I but wanted. I had a long cool, lot of long cool women in black dresses, believe me. Did, did you write that yourself? No, Alan Clark and oh. a guy called Roger Cook, one okay. of the uh, Cook Greenaway. They wrote a lot of the Fortune songs. They wrote that. You Ain't Heavy was written by Alan Clark as well? Re uh, I wish I'd have written that. Uh, two American songwriters again, Bobby Scott and Bobby Russell wrote He Ain't Heavy. Um, How about the yeah, there's been a lot, a lot of long cool women. It's cost me a lot of money, actually, over the years. That's why I'm sitting here. Why do you think I'm sitting here? How about the air that I breathe? Selling CDs for ex-wives, you know. Who, who wrote the air that I breathe? Who wrote that song? It's air? true. Sorry. Who wrote the air that I breathe? Uh, Albert Hammond. Albert Hammond Great and, song, it, right? and his son actually is out there now, Albert Hammond uh, Jr., he calls himself. Would you? That's very American, isn't it, to call your son the same name as you, you know? Not very imaginative, but very <laughs> but American. Very Th clever. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask a question about the cavern. I've been to the new cavern. I think I was there right after it opened. And it is, you know, you go down a very deep staircase and everything, and it's not as dingy, but can you, have you been to the new one, and is it comparable to the original one? I have been to the new one, and it, it, it's, 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 you know, it's as near as you're going to get. 
But it's not the real thing. I mean, you know, there's a bar there. I mean, there was no bar. You couldn't get a drink in the cavern. And the reason most of us were only 14 years old, you know, the cavern club was for kids. If you see photographs of the cavern club, even when the Beatles were playing, look at the audience. They're 14, 15, 16. I mean, and there's a lot of people who said, have said to me, ah, oh, I should go to the cavern and see the Beatles. Well, you know what? It would be 15,000 capacity if that was the case. It was about 300 capacity. And, and, and you know what? People would, it would only be from people from Liverpool and Merseyside, really, who would be at the Cavern Club. Uh, because first of all, it's somebody from the other side of the country, like Hull. Or so. Someone said to me once, my dad used to come from Hull to you know, see you guys at the Cavern. Well, it would take him three days to get there. <laughs> it was just a very dingy little place. It was amazing how much talent came out of the Cavern Club. I mean, just that area, you know, from the Beatles to Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer, the Searchers. I mean, just the list goes on. It's fantastic. Terry, I have a question for you. Was oh, there a band in that? There's a guy who looks like he was on the stage before. I, I know, he, keeps, he follows me. Was there a band of that era that you thought, God, these guys are going to make it, and they never did? Yes, huh? my first group, the Escorts. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't. No, go on, sorry. Yeah, that's what I mean. Was there somebody going that we don't know about that you went, boy, how did they not make it? Well, I think, I think the young lady talking about The Undertakers, there, there's one band who were fantastic and just never, never, probably never even made it out of Liverpool, never mind England. Uh, I, I can't think offhand, there was, there was lots of talent, you know, um, but you, again, getting back to the original conversation when I was standing up there getting tired, uh, <laughs> you know, you've got to have more than talent, you've got to have more than looks, you've got to have more than luck, you, you kind of got to have it all, and, and then you've got to have that inner drive, just, I mean, you've just got to be driven. And as I said about Wayne, people out like the sports guys, you know, the, the, I love talking to people and listening to that because there is something th that's inside that just, you've, that they won't take no for an answer. And no matter how many times someone knocks them down, they'll come back up fighting, you know? And it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I mean, I, I, I always use the word luck with me because there's a lot more talented people than me in the world, believe me. But I've had a lot of luck on the way, been in the right place at the right time and then also making decisions at the right time. And sometimes you walk around a corner, you know, you can see a girl, you walk around the corner, and uh, the, maybe the decision's been made for you. You know, you just, and you know what I always do? I just take the decision, not now, my wife's here. But I, I agree 100% with what you're saying, that so many, you know, guys on the radio, they send me the tapes of their bands and things, and say, what do I do now? And they, I say, just, just play, just play every night, play seven nights a week, 52 weeks a year that I think you've you got to play in the right luck. places as well. You've got, to, you've got to know where to go. I mean, if, you, if you're an actor or an actress, you, you go to Hollywood, you know, if you, things like that. You know, in England, for instance, as soon as the Beatles made it uh, and had hit records, they went straight to London because that's where all the uh, TV stations were. I mean, in Liverpool, Liverpool didn't get their first radio station until 1971. Wow. No, everyone says, what was it like to hear you on local radio? There was no local radio. It was all the BBC. And so if you, went to, if you wanted to go and be on the BBC, you had to drive to London. And then what happened, Manchester got a small station, BBC, but Liverpool never had a station until Radio Merseyside in 1971. And it would all finish then. It was, right. finished. It was eight years later, you know? You, you come in the day it ends, the day it's all gone. Did the Beatles... The Beatles' success, did that spill over and did that help oh. you a great deal, that open doors? Salami, salami, <laughs> below me. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. You, you wouldn't be here probably without the Beatles. Absolutely. If you think about it. I agree. Well, none of us, I mean, I think that they, they extended our careers beyond anything. I mean, we, you know, who thought of we still, I mean, I've been in the business 45 years. It's unbelievable. I'm still at it, you know? Right, who thought we'd be here talking about it to a ballroom full of people who wanted to That's hear That's right, I'm delighted and thanks for coming out, you know. In this weather, the weather was uh, nice today though, I like it yes. today. Oh, by the way, happy St. Patrick's Day. To of everyone. course. Yes, thank you. From oh, I forgot about that. Get the Guinness going. Ah, uh, the wearing of the green. Yes, sir, you might have a question for Terry. Hi. What is your favorite recollection of being with the Beatles at the Cavern? And also, were you, did you happen to be there when Brian Epstein showed up? 
Well, I wasn't there. I obviously heard the story. Uh, you know, we know the story of Epstein and uh, the guy going in the radio station and uh, no, sorry, the guy going in Nem's records shop and asking for, uh, you know, the record and all that. Uh, but I wasn't uh, at that day or that lunchtime because it was a lunchtime. The, the Cavern used to have lunchtime sessions as well as evening sessions. So, what would happen is Ray McFall, who was the manager, he would book you. Uh, you know, you say he booked the escort, he'd call me and say, oh, no, I'd sit with him and say, we're doing this day, that day. And then he'd say something like, well, on Friday, do, do you want to do the lunchtime and the evening? We used to love that because what would happen is we'd do the lunchtime for the workers in the office, offices around, and then he'd close the cavern at about two o'clock, and then he'd give us the key. So we could pra rehearse in the old afternoon and learn new songs in the cavern, beautiful, great sound it was in there. Then we, about four o'clock we'd go for a Chinese meal, you know, come back, open it up again at six and, and then start up again. But no, um, the Beatles, my recollection of the Beatles mainly was just, uh, they, were little, they were different. They were different. They, first of all, they were five years older than me, which I remember being quite jealous at the time. But now I'm quite delighted actually. <laughs> I like it now. But they, they were... Um, different. I mean, they, we were all wearing gold lame suits. They were wearing black leather. But I, I don't know if you probably have seen, you see those first photographs of that first session they did at Abbey Road uh, when, you know, they were doing Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. They were in suits with shirts and ties. That's because Brian Epstein cleaned them up. So what he did, he came in, took away all that leather stuff, cleaned them up and put them into basically what we were wearing. It's amazing. Because we were walking, we were going in the suits, but Epstein, I think he saw that maybe they were a bit too rough around the edges for, for the establishment, you know? It was, you know, he, he had such an eye for how to sell. Oh, he, he was, he's just amazing, what, what he did. And he had, his, his stable, as they call it, you know, the stable, uh, had, had all, you know, Scylla Black and Billy Jay and Jerry, Tommy Quickly, you know. And, in fact, there was a rumor that he wanted to sign the escorts. Really? Um, yeah, but we were all, we were with another manager. Uh, who wasn't as good as Epstein, but we signed, so what can you do, you know? And by the way, it's also a sin that he is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as well. Well, yeah, the, getting back to the Hollies in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I read a story the other, yesterday, I don't know how true, well, it was in the paper, so I don't know whether it's true or not, but anyway, I'll go for I know it. What you're gonna About do. the Dave Clark Five. Yes, did you, I don't know if you guys have heard this story. No, the Dave do you Clark want to do five. it, please? Well, yeah. I, think I, I, mean, I think I've got it right. They actually got more votes than some hip-hop Grand act. Grandmaster Flash. Grandmaster the, who? The rap yeah. group. Yeah, right, and apparently uh, it, it just wasn't politically correct to not have these guys in. So Dave Clark should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so should the Hollies, by the way. And so Absolutely. should Billy J, and so should Jerry. And so should Brian Epstein, you're right. As, as you guys, especially a week like this, where you guys send me thousands of emails, and why not the Moody Blues, and why not the Hollies, and why not? And the answer is, for what they do right, they do right. But this is a private club run by one guy and his friends, and they let in who they choose to let in. It's not about album sales or popularity, or it is simply a star chamber and a private club. So. That's the best and the worst of it, is if they don't like this, it, it doesn't happen. And if they want a rap act, even though their own members vote for Dave Clark Five, the one, the greatest sin to me is, I mean, hopefully Mike Smith will get better or there's, there's better things to have for Mike Smith, but now is the time to induct the Dave Clark Five so Mike could at least have experienced that. It's a, it's a sin they didn't do it. That's just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, questions? Yes, I saw some other hands up. Where, where'd you guys go? No, they don't care about us at all. I have a question. Take me back to, uh, we talked about recording at Abbey Road. You know, it, reading about Jeff Emmerich's book about Abbey Road and that it was kind of dingy and it wasn't very, uh, you know, it was very old school and they, the equipment was old and the, the equipment hardly worked and they had to beg, borrow and steal to make new equipment. And in this dingy, old, stodgy recording place in St. John's Wood where the engineers wore their lab coats and That's things right. were done properly, you, the Beatles, Pink Floyd. It's, I mean, uh, the zombies. It, the music that came out of that place lasts forever. What about Cliff Richard? He used Cl to record that. <laughs> Cliff I Richard. like Cliff Richard. He's one of my favorites. What was, what was in the water? 
in that building that created such amazing music? Well, I think it's very interesting what you just said, actually. You do actually ask some interesting questions occasionally. You know, you do it long very enough, good. Thank something you. slips out. Thank you very much. Uh, I, think, I think it was us that were in there that made the place good. I think we made the... Because it was, it was pretty cold. And as you say, the end, when I first went there, the, the guys who were, like, you know, on the engineers, pulling the buttons and doing the, pressing the buttons and pulling the thing back and everything, they were dressed in lab coats. I mean, it was like, it was like being in a laboratory for music. And it was... Right. Actually, it used to scare the life out of you. And also what would happen is, especially the, the non-famous you know, the, the, the non groups, if you like, you'd be told, OK, you've got three hours to do an A-side, and then we're having a break, we have tea, everyone has tea in England, you know that, and then you're coming back and then you do the B-side and we'll mix it. And, and then, the, so the pressure was on, we have six hours to make an A and a B-side, so it was no, probably no wonder I couldn't get a hit record, but then the, John Lennon changed all that. John Lennon changed it, he was the, you see, what would happen, you have a morning session, 10 till 1, well, who wants to sing at 10 in the morning, so that, that's a bit of a waste of time. Then 1 o'clock, lunch, then 2 till 5, then tea thing, and then several till ten. And John Lennon sat there one night, apparently, and said, uh, you know, everyone started putting their coats on to go at ten o'clock, and he said, why are we leaving now? It's now I feel like playing music, you know. And, and suddenly some, and George, Har well, George Martin said, he's right. Maybe we should come in at seven and be leaving at three in the morning, because that's your, you know, let's get the thing. And that, they changed the whole thing. And in fact, they used to stay. In fact, I remember doing a session with the Hollies once, and there was a bed in the corner. And that's where John and Yoko were sleeping the night before. Right, right, right. And there's another story about Abbey Road, I'll tell you. When I was in the Blue Jeans, I told you about the uh, When I'm 64 story. Well, they used to always record in Studio 2, and all their gear, all their amps and their guitars used to be piled up in the corner, and they didn't even have covers on it. So... What did you do? What did I do? I take the Rickenbacker out, so I play, I play John Rickenbacker, I've played Paul's left-handed bass, and I've played George's Gretsch. Nice! Yeah! The thing is, what, made me, what makes me think, there's a door just at the side. You could have easily backed the van up and took the lot out, and no one would have ever known. Because I'm from Liverpool, and we're like that in Liverpool. <laughs> but no, I actually did, and uh, it, it was amazing. Uh, and obviously we used to see them, because there was a little canteen there. Yeah. And all, everyone used to be, because between five and seven... You Everybody could, you took their dinner break. Everyone down in the canteen. So they'd just be chatting away, and uh, yeah, good times, good times. And they listen, did they ever come in and listen to what you guys were doing? Oh, you mentioned yeah. that Paul stopped in. But Paul used to come in a lot, but the trouble was he always he was smoking like a storm. He always had a cigarette in his mouth. And I, I don't like, I don't like, I've never smoked in my life. And he'd walk in and he'd, he'd have these real big senior service cigarettes, really smelly, horrible things. And it was, but I still like Paul. <laughs> oh, by the way, have you been reading the latest about Paul? And yes. His, and his wife, oh dear. Yes. He made a big mistake there, baby. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. But, you know, as there's an old saw, you know, and we always used to be told that in high school, that, you know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Well, to me, when, when life gives McCartney lemons, he opens a lemonade factory and bottling plant to sell <laughs> to the entire world. And... In the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear an announcement that, let's just say, don't worry about what Paul gives out in the divorce settlement. Mm. It's, it, he's reinventing himself yet again and coming out with a new yeah. line. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the things that, you know, there are people, I, I've, you know, criticism, John had the soul, Paul was the shallow businessman. You know, Keith Richards has the soul. Mick is the cold-hearted business guy. Even in with heavy metal music, Metallica, you, you know, James Hetfield goes to rehab, and the, the drummer, the manager, Lars Ulrich, is an idiot because he just worries about the tour. But it seems like with all the bands that survive, there's one guy in the band who just cracks the whip and keeps it going. Mm -hmm. And I've come to realize, and I, I, I hated those guys. I was, I was about... John and it's Keith and you realize you have to have both you have to have a guy who says go on get out of bed You don't feel good. That's fine. Get out of bed. Let's go. We got a show. Oh, yeah I've never met you know 60 years old in John. I was 60 years old in January and uh, Never missed a show in my life for any for any illness or anything. Is that wood? Is yes. It, it's a box. Oh, it's a box amp. Oh my God, I feel at home now <laughs> uh, Yeah, uh, never just just one of them things. I just kind of lucky uh, don't get ill too much, 
you know. So, uh, but never missed a show. And while well, I was in the Hollies 13 years, and uh, we we never missed we never missed a concert anywhere in the world for any reason. Uh, you know, even being late or anything on a flight, just just very lucky. It's uh, and again, uh, this is something that that you'll hear next week at Q104. Pete Townsend was talking about. He said it was a post-war middle-class work ethic. We had a job. I happen to have a fantastic job, and I get lots of money. And the downside is you have no privacy. The upside is it's fantastically exciting, exhilarating, but it's a job. If we, even if we had a punch out, if we had a route before the show, nobody ever said, well, I'm not doing the show. You did what you had to do. But when it was t fellas time to go, we clean ourselves up and you oh, hit the stage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we used to, when, you, you know, you, when you're touring with four or five guys plus a couple of roadies and a manager, and uh, it, it's kind of high profile and it's fast moving. I mean, we used to argue like crazy, of course, you know, and, and as you say, but as soon as that curtain goes across, all smiles and all fun. I mean, sometimes we do a show and there'll be people standing ovation and everything. And yet Tony Hicks and Bobby Ellis, they'd be fighting in the dressing room about mistakes that were made. But the, the audience never saw it, you know, the audience never, never heard it, who cares? As long as the audience liked it, you know. That, that's something that I really believe is sorely lacking in a lot of the performers today. Not all, but a lot, is that if it doesn't go exactly the way they want, they're off and we're done. We call and, them drama queens. And there's plenty. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's way too many of them around. Yes, sir, you had your hand if you have a question. Yeah, my name is Michael. It's, it's not more it's not a question as much as it, is it a comment that this guy, Terry Sylvester, in 1974, put out a solo album that if you don't have it, find it on eBay or something. It's the greatest make-out album ever. <laughs> it's got a full symphony orchestra on it. I believe Ron Richards produced it. But, but it sounds nothing like the Hollies. It's all Terry Sylvester. Unbelievable harmonies, great string arrangements. It's just one of the greatest albums ever. That's very kind. Thank you very much. It's called Terry Sylvester. So actually, I do have a website. You can get that album on my website. Actually, it's, uh, my website's called, of all things, TerrySylvester.com. Isn't that weird? I, <laughs> Why don't you find something easier to remember? <laughs> I tried PaulMcCartney.com, but it was already taken. <laughs> yes, sir. Quick question. Thank you. Is there any possibility, do you think, of us ever hearing another live Graham Nash, Terry Sylvester, Clark, et cetera, Holly's concert? Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there's people thinking about it. And, uh, you know, who knows? You, you know, no one can see into the future. So uh, the way things are at the moment, any, anything could happen. And, and, and that would be cool to have Graham in as well. You know, it'd be fantastic. <laughs> I'm, doing some, I'm doing some songs tonight, if you're sticking around. I'm with the band Liverpool. I'm doing four songs later, so... Uh, and they're, they're great as well. Quick story. Last time Graham came up to the radio station, and I asked him the same question this gentleman asked you. I said, so, you know, there's always breaks in CSN. How about a Holly's reunion? And he said, you know, he goes, as opposed to that question going away, I actually get asked that more and more often. And he said... Why would, I do th why would I do that? And I said, because I want to hear it. And he stopped and said, okay, that's the first like, honest answer anybody ever gave me. I said, not for you, not just for the fans, just for a bunch of people who are dying to hear this music. And he said, fair enough, fair maybe, enough. Maybe we'll do it in Carnegie Hall and I'll get to go there one day. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Hey, we're running out of time. Do we have any more, like a last uh, question or two? Uh, uh, thank you. Yes, sir. <sighs> this is good. Yes. Just relaxing in front of the TV with about 400 people watching you. It's kind of funny. Hi, I remember uh, John Lennon saying some sort of negative things about the Holly. Was this a bit of competition or is it a Manchester Liverpool thing or something? I think, uh, well, I'm from Liverpool, so, and this was before I joined, uh, but yeah, I think what happened was uh, there was a song called If I Needed Someone that George Harrison wrote, and I'm, it might have been on the Help album, I'm not an expert, but I think it was around that part, and the Hollies did a cover of it, and actually got, got into the top 20 in England with it, and I, I, I think somebody might have said something out of turn, one of the Hollies might have said our version is better than the Beatles, which is not the cleverest of things to tell with people like John Lennon around, and I think that's what kind of started it, but yeah, there was a Manchester-Liverpool thing anyway, 
And uh, in fact, the Hollies were known as Manchester's Beatles, so there's always been a bit of a thing going. But uh, yeah, I mean, hey, it's just friendly, friendly rivalry, I think. Because I don't know, any time I've ever asked Billy J. Kramer, I said, So, did you like Freddie and the Dreamers? No. Yeah, exactly. Hated them. Why? They're, They're from, from Manchester. Manchester. <laughs> It's only 30 miles away. I mean, it's amazing how it's such a, such, Jesus, that was very <laughs> such a short ride. 30 miles is nothing, you know, to Liverpool to Manchester. Right. And, and, the, and the football rivalry is even more. That battle line is dry. I support Liverpool FC. Which are, which are you? Red, Liverpool FC. Red? Liverpool, but then Manchester United, of course, are kind of more, more well known, which is saddy. saddy. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Sylvester. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time.